Hello there. In this video, I'm going to talk about the difference between angular velocity and angular frequency by walking us through three different uh, little scenarios or exercises. Okay, so let's go ahead and just get right into this. So I've gone ahead and I drew a circle here on the xy plane. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a vector. Okay, I'm going to define some position vector from my origin. I'll call this R, and it's just going to point to a location on this circle, okay? And it's at some angle theta with the x-axis. And so, if this circle has some radius, we'll go ahead and make it, uh, you know, give it some radius R, okay? And now if I go in and I define some unit vectors, here's my x-hat direction, here is my y-hat direction, just like this, right? Then what would my position vector R be? You tell me. It would simply be equal to r times cosine theta in the x hat direction, right? Plus r times sine theta in the y hat direction, right? Super simple. So then from here, what I can do though is let's make this uh, angle time dependent. Let's make this angle theta as a function of time. And in fact, I'm going to parameterize this in a way that this is just equal to some constant omega times t, okay? And if we do this, let me go ahead and write out r is equal to, and I'll go ahead and take my uh, capital R outside. Then we have cosine omega t x plus sine omega t y. Well, the significance of this omega is very, very clear. This is the angular velocity of my circle. Let's go ahead and make sure that that makes sense, right? And one way to see this very uh, immediately is we can see that if my theta as a function of time is parameterized as omega times t, then d theta dt is just going to be equal to omega, right? So the rate of change of my angle with respect to time is just going to be this constant omega. That is the definition of angular velocity, right? So the angle theta spanned in this little arc here is omega times t, okay? So that's one very clear argument as to why this omega here is very clearly my angular velocity. By the way, even if this omega was not a constant, okay, and we had some changing angular velocity, like we had an angular acceleration, we could still use this very general definition, d theta dt, to go ahead and define angular velocity at some moment in time. But, when we have a constant angular velocity, like how I parameterized in this situation, right, then I can always also write this as some delta theta in some delta t, right? In other words, I have some discrete, some, you know, very finite change in angle per change in time as well. And to capitalize on this definition, to, to make one more really useful definition with this, um, let's go ahead and think about when delta theta is equal to 2 pi, okay? So when delta theta is equal to 2 pi, let's go ahead and say that I'm at this point, this red point here that I've marked, right? I'm at some initial angle right now, and now I'm going to traverse 2 pi more radians, right? And that's a complete circle, right? 2 pi radians is the angles in a, in a circle. So I traverse back to the same point. So this would be theta plus 2 pi is my current angle, or delta theta is just equal to 2 pi. We go ahead and we define, okay, so, that, so this is happening in, I'm just going to plug in 2 pi for delta theta. We give the change in time for this process a very special symbol and a special name. And we go ahead and we define it as the period. And we can define this period for any cyclical motion. 
okay? And so this period is the amount of time for any cyclical process between two successive identical states, right? So in this circle, I'm returning to the exact same point in some time, capital T, my period. But I want to be clear that we can define this period for any cyclical process, not just circular motion. All right, so for the next exercise, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pull out the x term here, and I'm going to call this x is equal to r cosine omega t, right? So this is the projection of my r vector onto the x-axis, and we can see that, you know, this motion is also going to be oscillatory, has this cosine behavior, right? Um, but you could deduce that not from, you know, this fancy cosine function, but just from the fact that this r vector, as it's moving in a circle, you know, as we've uh, clearly shown that this is a circular motion, that this kind of, this projection onto the x-axis would then move back and forth as r circles around. But what I want to do with this is let's go ahead and start taking derivatives of this position. So I'm going to take the first derivative uh, with respect to time, dx dt. And of course, you could tell me what this is without even hardly thinking. This is going to be minus r omega sine omega t, a very nice and easy derivative. And the second derivative, d squared x dt squared, is going to be minus I'm going to write the omega squared outside here. So we have minus omega squared r cosine omega t. I just took two derivatives. But look, I can now go in and I can plug this x in here, uh, you know, back in, right? This r cosine omega t matches with x. So I'm just going to plug that in. And we get to this really nice expression, right? I have d squared x dt squared is equal to minus omega squared x. Hmm. Well, that's really interesting. I'm going to go ahead and box this, uh, box this expression here for a second. Okay. Okay, cool. So now I'm going to imagine a second problem, right? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put like a wall over here and I'm going to have some particle and this particle is on a spring in the x axis. Okay, and this right here, this origin is going to be the unstretched position of the spring. So in this case, at this location, uh, you know, I've gone in and this and the spring is stretched out. Okay, so this here, this is my equilibrium position of my spring. Right, and so if I'm at some location X here, then Hooke's law tells me that the force produced by my spring is going to be minus kx. Okay, so I call this my restoring force. I have f is equal to minus kx. And by Newton's second law, this is going to be equal to the mass of my particle times its acceleration, d squared x dt squared. And so I can go through, I can go ahead and divide both sides of this expression by m, okay? And I have d squared x dt squared. But hold on a second, right? This expression right here is identical to this expression on the left here, right? So if I go ahead and I define uh, this k over m as omega squared, then I'm going to be left with d squared x dt squared is equal to minus omega squared times x. So let's remind ourselves where these expressions came from. So this came from the projection of circular motion onto our x-axis and this came from a separate problem of looking at a Hooke's law spring well guess what they have the exact same equations of motion form right 
So in other words, these two motions here are identical, identical motions. So in other words, what was the motion of our, uh, you know, our circular motion projected onto the x-axis? It's r cos omega t. So this Hooke's law spring is also going to have something of the form r cosine omega t for its position as a function of time. Now, now the reality is if you were to solve this differential equation analytically and as generally as possible, right, this would really give you uh, your position as a function of time is equal to a cosine omega t plus some phase shift phi, where a and phi, these are arbitrary constants. But what I'm trying to show here is that, look, if I stretch my spring out, right, and I pull the spring and I'm holding it here, I pull it out to this radius r, I pull the spring out to this radius r and I let it go, then it's going to oscillate back and forth just as though, you know, I started a turntable, right, and, you know, this turntable has a particle circling on it and I project that motion onto the x-axis. These motions will be identical if I set the angular velocity of this turntable to something very specific, right? What angular velocity do I need to set the turntable at? Okay, well let's go ahead and think. Before, we, uh, when we were solving the spring problem, we defined omega Omega was defined as square root k over m. So for these two equations to truly be identical to each other, then this omega here in my, you know, in my circular motion uh, equation, this angular velocity must also be equal to square root k over m. So if I go ahead and I tune my turntable, okay, to have an angular velocity of square root k over m, these motions will line up exactly one to one with each other. So in light of this fact that the projection of this circular motion onto the x-axis and the Hooke's law spring are more or less the same, you know, kinds of motion, we go ahead and we define the omega in the Hooke's law spring this is defined as the angular frequency now, pointing out that, you know, it's angular in nature from the fact that, you know, this motion is connected to circles and that it's a projection of a circular motion, right? So that's a really, really powerful kind of recognition to have. But no, there's no like angular velocity here. I'm not, the spring is not literally traversing angles of a circle. It's a projection into, you know, this one dimensional uh, line here. But of course, this is going to be inherently related to the period of my oscillation, right? Remember, period is the amount of time it takes for me to get back to the same place in my motion. So this is going to be equal to two pi over my period t, just like it was, you know, for my, uh, for my circular motion before, right? Of course it is, because, you know, th they have this one-to-one -one kind of correspondence with each other, okay? So my angular frequency is also equal to 2 pi over the period of my spring's motions. All right, and so for this final kind of exercise here, what I want to ask us is, what about for non-sinusoidal periodic functions? What if I give you any kind of periodic function? Because I don't immediately see how this would connect to a circle at all, right? I give you this square wave here, and sure, it has some... I, I could define some period for this, right? Because that's a very general definition. I just need to find the, 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 the time that it takes to kind of be in the same spot here. So that would be my period. But does it make sense for me to define, 
you know, this parameter omega as two pi over this t, right? Does an angular frequency make sense here? Because, well, I, I don't know how we derived this shape from circles, right? But the thing is, is that that square wave can really be thought of as being built up as, you know, a big linear combination of harmonics of sine and cosine waves just added together. So, you know, and to mathematically figure out what those harmonics are, we'd have to talk more about the Fourier series, but I don't want to go into all of the math details right but the point is very conceptually easy to understand i add enough sine and cosine functions you know tuned the right way to each other and i can build up this uh this square wave back up but here's the point that i want to make is that you know let's go ahead and look at the 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 period of this what what i'm calling this is a good enough uh exact form for my square wave right so i can see here I go and it takes me, so if this is x and this is t here, I have some period t is equal to 2, right? t is equal to 2. Now this period t is equal to 2 is in fact exactly identical to the period of my first harmonic. This is also t is equal to 2, right? That's not true for any other subsequent harmonic, by the way. You know, as we add in more and more harmonics, you know, their frequencies get, you know, they, they go up, they, they turn into skinnier and skinnier uh, uh, sinusoidal functions. But that's really interesting that I can take the period of my overall, you know, finished periodic function, and that's going to have the same period as my first harmonic, okay? so. Actually, when we say take omega and define it as 2 pi over my period t of any of any periodic function, really, I'm going to call this omega naught. This is the fundamental angular frequency. Right? And it refers to the angular frequency of my first, you know, sinusoidal harmonic. And of course, as we talked about in the entirety of this video, right, that, you know, these sine and cosine waves, these oscillations, just like my spring, are very connected to circles. So, you know, it does absolutely make sense for us to define these angular uh, frequencies you know, for uh, any periodic motion, not just periodic motions that are, you know, sinusoidal in nature. Um, but anyways, I'll go ahead and end the, uh, the video here. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to the channel. Other than that, thank you so, so much for watching.